when the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being. There was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and he emerged Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together, before meadow land had coalesced and reed bed was to be found, when not one of the gods had been formed, or had come into being, when no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created within them. Lamu and Mahamu were formed and came into being, while they grew and increased in stature, Ansar and Kisar, who excelled them, were created. They prolonged their days, they multiplied their years. Anu, their son, could rival his fathers. Anu, the son, equaled Ansar. And Anu begat Nudamad, his own equal. Nudamad was the champion among his fathers, profoundly discerning, wise, of robust strength, very much stronger than his father's begetter, Ansar. He had no rival among the gods, his brothers. The divine brothers came together. Their clamor got loud, throwing Tiamat into a turmoil. They jarred the nerves of Tiamat, and by their dancing they spread alarm in Anduruna. Apsu did not diminish their clamor, and Tiamat was silent when confronted with them. Their conduct was displeasing to her. Yet though their behavior was not good, she wished to spare them. Thereupon Apsu, the begetter of the great gods, called Mumu, his vizier, and addressed him. Vizier Mumu, who gratifies my pleasure, come, let us go to Tiamat. They went and sat, facing Tiamat. As they conferred about the gods, their sons, Apsu opened his mouth and addressed Tiamat. Their behavior has become displeasing to me, and I cannot rest in the daytime or sleep at night. I will destroy and break up their way of life. That silence may reign, and we may sleep. When Tiamat heard this, she raged and cried out to her spouse. She cried in distress, fuming within herself. She grieved over the plotted evil. How can we destroy what we have given birth to? Though their behavior causes distress, let us tighten discipline graciously. Mumu spoke up with counsel for Atsu. As from a rebellious vizier was the counsel of his Mumu. Destroy, my father, that lawless way of life, that you may rest in the daytime and sleep by night. Apsu was pleased with him, and his face beamed, because he had plotted evil against the gods, his sons. Mumu put his arms around Apsu's neck. He sat on his knees, kissing him. What they plotted in their gathering was reported to the gods, their sons. The gods heard it and were frantic. They were overcome with silence and sat quietly. Ea, who excels in knowledge, the skilled and learned. Ea, who knows everything, perceived their tricks. He fashioned it and made it to be all-embracing. He executed it skillfully as supreme, his pure incantation. He recited it and set it on the waters. He poured sleep upon him as he was slumbering deeply. He put Apsu to slumber as he poured out sleep. And Mumu, the counselor, was breathless with agitation. He split Apsu's sinews, ripped off his crown. He carried away his aura and put it on himself. He bound Apsu and killed him. Mumu he confined and handled roughly. He set his dwelling upon Apsu and laid hold on Mumu, keeping the nose rope in his hand. After Ea had bound and slain his enemies, had achieved victory over his foes, he rested quietly in his chamber. He called it Apsu, whose shrines he appointed. Then he founded his living quarters within it, and Ea and Damkina, his wife, sat in splendor. In the chamber of the destinies, the room of the archetypes, the wisest of the wise, the sage of the gods, Bel was conceived. In Apsu was Marduk born. In a pure Apsu was Marduk born. Ea, his father, begat him. Damkina, his mother, bore him. He sucked the breasts of the goddesses. A nurse reared him and filled him with terror. His figure was well developed, the glance of his eyes was dazzling, his growth was manly, he was mighty from the beginning. Anu, his father's begetter, saw him. He exulted and smiled, his heart filled with joy. Anu rendered him perfect, his divinity was remarkable, and he became very lofty, excelling them in his attributes. His members were incomprehensibly wonderful, incapable of being grasped with the mind, 
hard to even look on. Four were his eyes, four his ears. Flame shot forth as he moved his lips. His four ears grew large, and his eyes likewise took in everything. His figure was lofty and superior in comparison with the gods. His limbs were surpassing, his nature was superior. Mariutu, Mariutu, the sun, the sun god, the sun god of the gods. He was clothed with the aura of the ten gods, so exalted was his strength. The fifty dreads were loaded upon him. Anu formed and gave birth to the four winds. He delivered them to him. My son, let them whirl. He formed a dust and set a hurricane to drive it. He made a wave to bring consternation on Tiamat. Tiamat was confounded. Day and night she was frantic. The gods took no rest. In their minds they plotted evil, and addressed their mother Tiamat. When Absu, your spouse, was killed, you did not go at his side, but sat quietly. The four dreadful winds have been fashioned to throw you into confusion, and we cannot sleep. You gave no thought to Apsu, your spouse, nor to Mumu, who is a prisoner. Now you sit alone. Henceforth you will be in frantic consternation. And as for us who cannot rest, you do not love us. Consider our burden. Our eyes are hollow. Break the immovable yoke that we may sleep. Make battle. Avenge them. Reduce to nothingness. Tiamat heard. The speech pleased her. She said, Let us make demons, as you have advised. The gods assembled within her. They conceived evil against the gods, their begetters, and took the side of Tiamat. Fiercely plotting, unresting by day and night, lusting for battle, raging, storming, they set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother Huber, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons and gave birth to giant serpents. They had sharp teeth, they were merciless. With poison instead of blood she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearful monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike. She said, let their onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the Hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, the scorpion man. Fierce demons, the fish man and the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fierceless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Altogether she made eleven of that kind. Among the gods, her sons, whom she constituted her host, she exalted King Lu and magnified him among them. The leadership of the army, the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons, campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, the chief executive power of battle, supreme command. She entrusted to him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered to you the rule of all the gods. You are indeed exalted, my spouse. You are renowned. Let your commands prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the tablet of destinies and fastened it to his breast, saying, your order may not be changed, but the utterance of your mouth be firm. After Kingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Anuship, he decreed the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouths subdue the fire god. May your poison by its accumulation put down aggression. Tiamat gathered together her creation and organized battle against the gods, her offspring. Henceforth, Tiamat plotted evil because of Apsu. It became known to Ea that she had arranged the conflict. Ea heard this matter. He lapsed into silence in his chamber and sat motionless. After he had reflected and his anger had subsided, he directed his steps to Ansar, his father. He entered the presence of the father of his begetter, Ansar, and related to him all of Tiamat's plotting. My father, Tiamat, our mother, has conceived a hatred for us. She has established a host in her savage fury. All the gods have turned to her. Even those you begat also take her side. Fiercely plotting, unresting by night and day, lusting for battle, raging, storming, they set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother Hubor, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons and gave birth to giant serpents. They had sharp teeth, they were merciless. With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearless monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike. 
she said, let the onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the Hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, and the scorpion man, fierce demons, the fish man, and the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fearless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Altogether, she made eleven of that kind. Among the gods, her sons, whom she constituted her host, she exalted King Gu and magnified him among them. The leadership of the army, the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons, campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, the chief executive, power of battle, supreme command. She entrusted to him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered to you the rule of all the gods. You are indeed exalted, my spouse, you are renowned. Let your commands prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the Tablet of Destinies and fastened it to his breast, saying, Your order may not be changed, let the utterance of your mouth be firm. After Kingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Anuship, he decreed the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouths subdue the fire god. May your poison by its accumulation put down aggression. Ansar heard. The matter was profoundly disturbing. He cried woe well and bit his lip. His heart was in fury. His mind could not be calmed. Over Ea, his son, his cry was faltering. My son, you who provoked the war, take responsibility for whatever you alone have done. You set out and killed Apsu, and as for Tiamat, whom you made furious, where is her equal? The gatherer of counsel, the learned prince, the creator of wisdom, the god Nudamad. With soothing words and calming utterance, gently answered his father Ansar. My father, deep mind, who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and destroy. Ansar, deep mind, who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and to destroy. I want to say something to you. Calm down for me for a moment, and consider that I performed a helpful deed. Before I killed Apsu, who could have seen the present situation? Before I quickly made an end of him, what were the circumstances were I to destroy him? Ansar heard. The words pleased him. His heart relaxed to speak to Ea. My son, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce, unequaled blow. Ea, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce and equal blow. Go before Tiamat and appease her attack, her fury with your incantation. He heard the speech of Ansar, his father. He took the road to her, proceeded on the route to her. He went, he perceived the tricks of Tiamat. He stopped, fell silent, and turned back. He entered the presence of August Ansar, penitently addressing him. My father, Tiamat's deeds are too much for me. I perceived her planning, and my incantation was not equal to it. Her strength is mighty, she is full of dread. She is altogether very strong, none can go against her. Her very loud cry did not diminish. I became afraid of her cry, and turned back. My father, do not lose hope. Send a second person against her. Though a woman's strength is very great, it is not equal to a man's. Disband her cohorts, break up her plans, before she lays her hands on us. Ansar cried out in intense fury, addressing Anu, his son. Honored son, hero, warrior, whose strength is mighty, whose attack is irresistible, hasten and stand before Tiamat. Appease her rage that her heart may relax. If she does not hearken to your words, address to her words of petition that she may be appeased. He heard the speech of Ansar, his father. He took the road to her, proceeded on the route to her. Anu went. He perceived the tricks of Tiamat. He stopped, fell silent, and turned back. He entered the presence of Ansar, the father who begat him, penitently addressing him. My father, Tiamat's deeds are too much for me. I perceived her planning, but my incantation was not equal to it. Her strength is mighty. She is full of dread. She is altogether very strong. No one can go against her. Her very loud noise does not diminish. I became afraid of her cry and turned back. My father, do not lose hope. Send another person against her. Though a woman's strength is very great, it is not equal to a man's. Disband her cohorts, break up her plans, before she lays her hands on us. Ansar lapped into silence, staring at the ground. He nodded to Ea, shaking his head. The Agigi are all the Anunnaki had assembled. 
They sat in tight like the silence. No god would go to face, would go out against Tiamat. Yet the Lord Ansar, the father of the great gods, was angry in his heart and did not summon anyone. A mighty son, the avenger of his father, he who hastens to war, the warrior Marduk. He has summoned him to his private chamber to explain to him his plans. Marduk, give counsel, listen to your father. You are my son who gives me pleasure. Go reverently before Ansar. Speak, take your stand, appease him with your glance. Bel rejoiced at his father's words. He drew near and stood in the presence of Ansar. Ansar saw him, his heart filled with satisfaction. He kissed his lips and removed his fear. My father, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires. Ansar, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires. Which man has drawn up his battle array against you, and will Tiamat, who is a woman, attack you with her weapons? My father, begetter, rejoice and be glad. Soon you will tread on the neck of Tiamat. Ansar, begetter, rejoice and be glad. Soon you will tread on the neck of Tiamat. Go, my son, conversant with all knowledge. Appease Tiamat with pure spell. Drive the storm chariot without delay. Bel rejoiced at his father's words. With glad heart he addressed his father. Lord of the gods, destiny of the great gods, if I should become your avenger, if I should bind Tiamat and preserve you, convene an assembly and proclaim for me an exalted destiny. Sit, all of you, in Epsukanaku with gladness. And let me, with my utterance, decree destinies instead of you. Whatever I instigate must not be changed, nor may my commands be nullified or altered. Ansar opened his mouth and addressed Kaka, his vizier. Vizier Kaka, who gratifies my pleasure, I will send you to Lamu and Lahamu. You are skilled in making inquiry, learned in address. Have the gods, my fathers, brought to my presence. Let all the gods be brought, let them confer as they sit at table. Let them eat grain, let them drink ale. Let them decree the destiny for Marduk their avenger. Go, be gone, Kaka, stand before them, and repeat to them all that I tell you. Ansar, your son, has sent me, and I am to explain his plans. I sent on you, but he could not face her. Nidamada took fright and retired. Marduk, the sage of the gods, your son, has come forward. He has determined to meet Tiamat. Quickly now, decree your destiny for him without delay, that he may go and face your powerful enemy. Kaka went, he directed his steps, to Lamu and Lahamu, the gods his fathers. He prostrated himself, he kissed the ground before them. When Lamu and Lahamu heard, they cried aloud. All the Agegi moaned in distress. When has gone wrong that she took this decision about us? We did not know what Tiamat was doing. All the great gods who decreed destinies gathered as they went. They entered the presence of Ansar and became filled with joy. They kissed one another in the assembly. They conferred as they sat at table. They ate grain, they drank ale. They strained the sweet liquor through their straws. As they drank beer and felt good, they became quite carefree, their mood was merry, and they decreed the fate for Marduk, their avenger. They set a lordly dais for him, and he took his seat before his fathers to receive kingship. They said, You are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Marduk, you are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Henceforth, your order will not be annulled. It is in your power to exalt and debase. Your utterance is sure. Your commands cannot be rebelled against. None of the gods will transgress the line you draw. Shrines for all the gods needs provisioning that you may be established where their sanctuaries are. You are Marduk, our avenger. We have given you kingship over the sum of the whole universe. Take your seat in the assembly. Let your word be exalted. Let your weapons not miss the mark, but may they slay your enemies. Bell, spare him who trusts in you, but destroy the god who set his mind on evil. They set a constellation in the middle and addressed Marduk their son. Your destiny, Bell, is superior to that of all the gods. Command and bring about annihilation and recreation. Let the constellation disappear at your utterance. With a second command, let the constellation reappear. He gave the command and the constellation disappeared. With a second command, the constellation came into being again. When the gods, his fathers, saw the effect of his utterance, they rejoiced and offered congratulation. 
Marduk is the king. They added to him a mace, a throne, and a rod. They gave him an irresistible weapon that overwhelms the foe. They said, go, cut Tiamat's throat, and let the winds bear up her blood to give the news. The gods, his fathers, decreed the destiny of Bel, and set him on the road, the way of prosperity and success. He fashioned a bow and made it his weapon. He set an arrow in place, with the bowstring on. He took up his club and held it in his right hand. His bow and quiver he hung at his side. He placed lightning before him and filled his body with tongues of flame. He made a net to enmesh the entrails of Tiamat, and stationed the four winds that no part of her escape. The south wind, the north wind, the east wind, the west wind. He put beside his nets winds given by his father Anu. He fashioned the evil wind, the dust storm, tempest. The fourfold wind, the sevenfold wind, the chaos spreading wind. He sent out the seven winds that he had fashioned, and they took their stand behind him to harass Tiamat's entrails. Bell took up the storm flood, his great weapon. He rode the fearful chariot of the irresistible storm. Four steeds he yoked to it and harnessed them to it. The destroyer, the merciless, the trampler, the fleet. Their lips were parted, their teeth bore venom. They were strangers to weariness, trained to sweep forward. At his right hand he stationed raging battle and strife. On the left, conflict that overwhelms a united battle array. He was clad in a tunic, a fearful coat of mail. And on his head he wore an aura of terror. Bell proceeded and set out on his way. He set his face toward the raging Tiamat. In his lips he held a spell. He grasped a plant to counter poison in his hand. Thereupon they milled around him, the gods milled around him. The gods, his fathers, milled around him, the gods milled around him. Bell drew near, surveying the maw of Tiamat. He observed the tricks of Kingu, her spouse. As he looked, he lost his nerve. His determination went, and he faltered. His divine aides, who were marching at his side, saw the warrior, the foremost, and their vision became dim. Tiamat cast her spell without turning her neck. In her lips she held untruth and lies. Bell lifted up the storm flood, his great weapon, and with these words threw it at the raging Tiamat. Why are you aggressive and arrogant, and strive to provoke battle? The younger generation have shouted, outraging their elders, but you, their mother, hold pity and contempt. Kingu you have named to be your spouse, and you have improperly appointed him to the rank of Anuship. Against Ansar, king of the gods, you have stirred up trouble, and against the gods, my father, your trouble is established. Deploy your troops, gird on your weapons. You and I will take our stand and do battle. When Tiamat heard this, she went insane and lost her reason. Tiamat cried aloud and fiercely. All her lower members trembled beneath her. She was reciting an incantation, kept reciting her spell, while the battle gods were sharpening their weapons of war. Tiamat and Marduk, the sage of the gods, came together, joining in strife, drawing near to battle. Bel spread out his net and enmeshed her. He let loose the evil wind, the rear guard, in her face. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. She let the evil wind in so that she could not close her lips. The fierce winds weighed down her belly. Her inwards were distended and she opened her mouth wide. He let fly an arrow and pierced her belly. He tore open her entrails and slit her innards. He bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. After he had killed the Tiamat, the leader, her assembly dispersed, her hosts scattered. Her divine aides who went beside her, in a trembling and fear beat retreat, to save their lives. But they were completely surrounded, unable to escape. He bound them and broke their weapons, and they lay enmeshed, sitting in a snare. Hiding in corners, filled with grief, bearing his punishment held in a prison. The eleven creatures who were laden with fearfulness. The throng of devils who went as grooms at her right hand. He put ropes upon them and bound their arms. Together with their warfare, he trampled them beneath them. Now Kingu, who had risen to power among them, he bound and reckoned with the dead gods. He took from him the Tablet of Destinies, which was not properly his, sealed it with a seal, and fastened it to his own breast. After the warrior Marduk had bound and slain his enemies, the arrogant enemy, had established victory for Ansar over all his foes, had fulfilled the desire of Nudamud. He strengthened his hold on the bound gods. 
and returned to Tiamat, whom he had bound. Bell placed his feet on the lower parts of Tiamat, and with his merciless club smashed her skull. He severed her arteries, and let the north wind bear up her blood to give the news. His father saw it, and were glad and exulted. They brought gifts and presents to him. Bell rested, surveying the corpse. In order to divide the lump by a clever scheme, he split her into two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens. He stretched the skin and appointed a watch, with the instruction not to let her waters escape. He crossed over the heavens, surveyed the celestial parts, and adjusted them to match the Apsu, new to Mud's abode. Bell measured the shape of the Apsu, and set up Asara, a replica of his gala. In his gala, Asara, which he had built in the heavens, he settled in their shrines Anu, Enlil, and Ea. He fashioned heavenly stations for the great gods, and set up constellations, the patterns of the stars. He appointed the year, marked off divisions, and set up three stars each for the twelve months. After he had organized the year, he established the heavenly station of Nibiru to fix the stars' intervals, that none should transgress or be slothful. He fixed the heavenly stations of Enlil and Ea with it. Gates he opened on both sides, and put strong bolts at the left and the right. He placed the heights of heaven in Tiamat's belly, created Nanar, entrusting to him the night. He appointed him as the jewel of the night to fix the days, and month by month, without ceasing, he elevated him with a crown, saying, Shine over the land at the beginning of the month, resplendent with horns to fix six days. On the seventh day, the crown will be half size. On the fifteenth day, halfway through each month, stand in opposition. When Samas sees you on the horizon, diminish in the proper stages and shine backwards. On the twenty-ninth day, draw near to the path of Samas. The thirtieth day, stand in conjunction and rival Samas. At the end, let there be the twenty-ninth day. He gathered it together and made it into clouds. The raging of the winds, violent rainstorms, the billowing of mists, the accumulation of her spittle. She appointed for himself and took them in his hand. He put her head in position and poured out. He opened the abyss and it was sated with water. From her two eyes he let the Euphrates and Tigris flow. He blocked her nostrils but left. He heaped up the distant mountains on her breasts. He bored wells to channel the springs. He twisted her tail and wove it into the derma, the apsu beneath his feet. He set up her crotch, it wedged up the heavens. Thus half of her, he stretched out and made it firm as the earth. After he had finished his work inside Tiamat, he spread his net and let it right out. He surveyed the heavens and the earth. After he had formulated his regulations and composed his decrees, he attached guide ropes and put them in Ea's hands. The tablet of destinies which Kingu had taken and carried, he took charge of it as a trophy and presented it to Anu. Now the eleven creatures to which Tiamat had given birth, he broke their weapons and bound them to his feet. He made images of them and stationed them at the gate of the Apsu, to be a sign never to be forgotten. The gods saw it, and were jubilantly happy, Lamu and Lahamu and all his fathers. Ansar embraced him and published abroad his title, Victorious King. Anu, Enlil, and Ea gave him gifts. Mother Damkina, who bore him, hailed him. With a clean festal robe she made his face shine. Tuzmu, who held her present to give the news, she entrusted the Vizarats of the Apsu in the care of the holy places. The Agigi assembled and all did obeisance to him. Every one of the Anunnaki was kissing his feet. They all gathered to show their submission. They stood, they bowed down, behold the king, and took their fill of his beauty. They listened to their utterance, being girded with the dust of battle. Anointing his body with cedar perfume, he clothed himself in his lordly robe, with a crown of terror as a royal aura. He took up his club and held it in his right hand. The scepter of prosperity and success he hung at his side. Previously Marduk was our beloved son. Now he is your king. Heed his command. Next they all spoke up together. His name is Lugal de Marinkia. Trust in him. They had given kingship to Marduk. They addressed to him a benediction for prosperity and success. Henceforth you are the caretaker of our shrine. Whatever your command we will do. Marduk opened his mouth to speak, and addressed the gods as fathers. Above the Apsu, the emerald abode, opposite to Sara, which I built for you, beneath the celestial parts, whose floor I made firm, 
I will build a house to be my luxurious abode. Within it I will establish its shrine. I will found my chamber and establish my kingship. When you come up from the Opsu to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. When you descend from heaven to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. I shall call its name Babylon, the homes of the great gods. Within it we will hold a festival that will be the evening festival. The gods, his fathers, heard this speech of his. With regard to the earth that your hands have made, in Babylon, as you have named it, put our resting place forever. Let them bring our regular offerings. He opened his mouth, showing them light. The gods bowed down, speaking to him. They addressed Lugal de Marenkia, their lord. Formerly, lord, you were our beloved son. Now you are our king. He who preserved us, the aura of club and scepter, let him conceive plans. When Marduk heard the gods' speech, he conceived a desire to accomplish clever things. He opened his mouth, addressing Ea. He counsels that which he had pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood to form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be man. I will create Lulu, man, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid that they may rest. I will skillfully alter the organization of the gods. Though they are honored as one, they shall be divided into two. Ea answered as he addressed a word to him, expressing his comments on the resting of the gods. Let one brother of theirs be given up. Let him perish that people may be fashioned. Let the great gods assemble, and let the guilty one be given up that they may be confirmed. Marduk assembled the great gods, using gracious direction as he gave his order. As he spoke, the gods heeded him. The king addressed a word to the Anunnaki. Your former oath was true indeed. Now also, tell me the solemn truth. Who is the one who instigated warfare? Who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion? Let him who instigated warfare be given up, that I may lay his punishment on him, but you sit and rest. The Agigi, the great gods, answered him. That is Lugal de Marenkia, the counselor of the gods, the lord. Kingu is the one who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. They bound him, holding him before Ea. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood Ea created mankind on whom he imposed the service of the gods, and set the gods free. After the wise Ea had created mankind, and had imposed the service of the gods upon them, that task is beyond comprehension, for Nudamud performed the creation with the skill of Marduk. King Marduk divided the gods, all the Anunnaku into the upper and lower groups. He assigned three hundred in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu, and appointed them as a guard. Next, he arranged the organization of the netherworld, in heaven and netherworld he stationed six hundred gods. After he had arranged all the decrees, and had distributed incomes among the Anunnaki of heaven and netherworld, the Anunnaki opened their mouths, and addressed their lord Marduk. Now, lord, seeing you have established our freedom, what favor can we do for you? Let us make a shrine of great renown. Your chamber will be our resting place wherein we may repose. Let us erect a shrine to house a pedestal wherein we may repose when we finish the work. When Marduk heard this, he beamed as brightly as the light of day. Build Babylon, the task you have sought. Let bricks for it be molded, and raise the shrine. The Anunnaki wielded the pick. For one year they made the needed bricks. When the second year arrived, they raised the peak of Esagil, a replica of the Apsu. They built the lofty temple tower of the Apsu. And for Anu, Enlil, and Ea, they established it as a dwelling. He sat in splendor before them, surveying its horns, which were level with the base of Asara. After they had completed the work on Esagil, all the Anunnaki constructed their own shrines. Three hundred Agigi of heaven and six hundred of the Apsu, all of them had assembled. Bel seated the gods, his fathers, at the banquet, in the lofty shrine which they had built for his dwelling, saying, This is Babylon, your fixed dwelling. Take your pleasure here, sit down and enjoy. The great gods sat down, beer mugs were set out, and they sat at the banquet. After they had enjoyed themselves inside, they held a service in Asa Nesigil. The regulations and all the rules were confirmed. All the gods divided the stations of heaven and netherworld. The college of the fifty great gods took their seats. The seven gods of destinies were appointed to give decisions. Bel received his weapons, the bow, and laid it before them. His divine fathers saw the net which he had made. 
His father saw how skillfully wrought was the structure of the bow, as they praised what he had made. Anu lifted it up in the divine assembly. He kissed the bow, saying, It is my daughter. Thus he called the names of the bow. Longstick was the first. The second was, May it hit the mark. With the third name, Bow Star, he made it to shine in the sky. He fixed its heaven's position along with its divine brothers. After Anu had decreed the destiny of the bow, he set down a royal throne, a lofty one even for a god. Anu set it there in the assembly of the gods. The great gods assembled. They exalted the destiny of Marduk and did obeisance. They invoked a curse on themselves and took an oath with water and oil and put their hands to their throats. They granted him the right to exercise kingship of the gods. They confirmed him as lord of the gods of heaven and netherworld. Ansar gave him his exalted name, Asala. At the mention of his name, let us show submission. When he speaks, let the gods heed him. Let his command be superior in upper and lower regions. May the sun, our avenger, be exalted. Let his lordship be superior and himself without rival. Let him shepherd the black heads, his creatures. Let them tell of his character to future days without forgetting. Let him establish lavish food offerings for his fathers. Let him provide for their maintenance and be caretaker of their sanctuaries. Let him burn incense to rejoice their sanctums. Let him do on earth the same as he has done in heaven. Let him appoint the black heads to worship him. The subject humans should take note and call on their gods. Since he commands, they should heed their goddesses. Let food offerings be brought for their gods and goddesses. May they not be forgotten. May they remember their gods. Though the blackheads worship someone, some another god, he is the god of each and every one of us. Come, let us call the fifty names of him whose character is resplendent, whose achievement is the same. Marduk, as he was named by his father Anu from his birth, who supplies pasturage and watering, making the stables flourish, who bound the boastful with his weapon, the storm flood, and saved the gods, his fathers, from distress. He is the sun, the sun god of the gods. He is dazzling. Let him ever walk in his bright light. On the peoples that he created, the living beings, he imposed the service of the gods and they took rest. Creation and annihilation, forgiveness and exacting the penalty, occur at his command, so let them fix their eyes on him. And Lil the father called him by his own name. Lord of the lands. Ea heard the names which all the Gigi. Ea heard the names which all the Yigigi called, and his spirit became radiant. Why, he whose name was extolled by his fathers, let him, like me, be called Ea. Let him control the sun of all my rights. Let him administer all my decrees. With the word fifty, the great gods called his fifty names and assigned him an outstanding position. They should be remembered. The leading figure should expound them. The wise and learned should confer about them. A father should repeat them and teach them to his son. One should explain them to shepherd and herdsmen. If one is not negligent to Marduk, the Enlil of the gods, may one's land flourish and oneself prosper, for his word is reliable, his command unchanged. No god can alter the utterance of his mouth. When he looks in fury, he does not relent. When his anger is ablaze, no god can face him. His mind is deep, his spirit all-embracing, before whom sin and transgression are sought out. Instruction, which a leading figure repeated before Marduk. He wrote it down and stored it so that generations to come might hear it. Marduk, who created the Agigi gods, though they diminish, let them call on his name, the Song of Marduk, who defeated Tiamat and took kingship.